Good morning and welcome to Chatham House. Welcome to the Korean Peninsula Peace Forum. Um, really delighted to be able to welcome uh, the Korean Ambassador, Your Excellency, Ambassador Park, uh, and Professor Chung-In Moon, uh, the Special Advisor to the President. This session is on the record. So you're at Chatham House, but for this session you're allowed to quote people by name uh, as well as what they say. So I think what I'll do first of all is ask uh, Ambassador Park to come up um, and say a word to us now. Uh, and then I'm just going to introduce the subject and, and call up the professor. We're going to aim to leave plenty of time for questions to the professor before finishing at 12. So Ambassador Park, you're very welcome. Um, recently arrived in London uh, with a long diplomatic career. Um, delighted to have you, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Ricketts. A distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome. It's my great pleasure to co-host the Korean Financial Peace Forum with the Chatham House today. I'd like to thank Dr. Champa Patel and uh, Dr. John uh, Nelson Wright for your generous hospitality, as well as uh, all of your excellent staff for the hard work in putting this event together. My thanks goes to Ambassador Martin Uden for his continued and unwavering support for Korea and for the embassy here in London. I also extend my appreciation to all the experts on the North Korean peninsula issues who have traveled from elsewhere in the UK, flown in from Europe and Korea to join us here this morning. I must say I'm most grateful to have secured Dr. Moon Jung In's participation at this event at such an important time. Just yesterday, South Korean President Moon Jae-in and U.S. President Donald Trump held a bilateral summit in Washington, D.C. It was the latest of our joint efforts to revive the momentum for dialogue with North Korea. Although the failure to reach an agreement in Hanoi has created some difficulties in advancing the peace process on the Korean Peninsula, it has become clear that neither the two Koreas nor the US want to go back to the animosity of the past. In particular, both the US and North Korea are demonstrating their willingness mm -hmm. to continue dialogue by exercising restraint in their own ways. President Trump has reaffirmed his willingness to continue talks with the North. Now, we expect there will be another South-North summit in the near future. And we hope, carefully hope, uh, there to be a su succession of con constructive meetings uh, between the US and the North preventing any party from derailing the talks and keeping the momentum going is ever more essential at this important juncture. We are dealing with a process of utmost subtlety. We know from history how, it is, how easy it is for these kinds of talks to collapse. Even small misunderstanding or mishandling of the issue can bring the process to an abrupt end. I have said this in several other occasions already, but I would like to reiterate, there is hard-earned and long-awaited window of opportunity for us to achieve the nuclearization of North Korea, as well as to build permanent peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. The international community should encourage North Korea to take the path, that path, for its own brighter future. It is an opportunity we, both the two Koreas, the US, and the international community as a whole must seize. I will reserve the assessment for the experts uh, here today. I hope today's forum gives each and every one of us some food for thought and insights in assessing where we are 
where we ought to go, and how we get there. I also hope that the discussion today will feed into our efforts to achieve peace on the Korean Peninsula. In closing, I'd like to quote the words of my president from his meeting with senior secretaries. Quote, through concerted efforts, where there is an obstacle, we will break through. And where there is no road, we will create one. If we work hard, we can pull it off. Such positive thinking will lead us to a positive result, unquote. So join us our, in our effort to make a breakthrough and pave the way. Together, we can pull this off. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy the day. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, Ambassador, and thank you for arranging for Professor Moon to come to London now. Uh, as you may have noticed, we have one or two other preoccupations in the UK at the moment, and it's quite hard to get attention for what is going on in the wider world. Um, and yet, it was not long ago, I think, that many of us felt that the North Korea nuclear issue was probably the most dangerous uh, flashpoint in the world, uh, the most imminent threat to, to uh, security in the world. Uh, and we have all watched um, with fascination the ups and downs of the uh, US-North Korean um, relationship over the last couple of years. Um, up uh, at the time of the Singapore summit with uh, that particular brand of President Trump's personal diplomacy, uh, and the hopes that created, and then a bit down at the Hanoi summit, um, not reaching any uh, specific agreement. Uh, and I think we're all very interested to have your assessment of where we are now in the process six weeks on from that summit. Very interesting to hear from the ambassador that, uh, that your president and President Trump uh, met yesterday, uh, and the prospects of a north-south summit before long, uh, because <coughs> I think it's in the interests of, of everyone to see the process move forward with the optimism, uh, Ambassador, uh, that you talk about. Um, I worried that after Hanoi, we might see a return to the old tactics of uh, threats from your northern neighbors uh, in an effort to stimulate more movement from the Americans. Um, I hope that that's not going to be the case and that um, uh, work is going on behind the scenes between Washington and Pyongyang, as well as between Seoul and Pyongyang, um, and I think uh, we have nobody better than, uh, than the professor to tell us about that. Professor, you are <coughs> special advisor to uh, the president of Korea, uh, the distinguished academic record, uh, also service in government uh, and in the foreign ministry. You clearly are better in South Korea at interchange between the academic sector and the, uh, and the <coughs> diplomatic sector than we are here in the UK. Um, I think it would be much more interesting for this audience to hear from you than from me, so I invite you, <coughs> Professor, to come and um, give us your remarks, uh, and then we will have questions. Please. Am I supposed to sit or stand? You, you, why don't you stand for this, maybe, and then come and sit after? Okay. Yeah. As you like, as you're comfortable. <laughs> Lord Lika, thank you very much for introducing me. And uh, I was given about 15 minutes, therefore I will try to compress my talk in 15 minutes. But I think it is very important for me to talk about President Moon Jae-in's peace initiative. You know, you, know, you all recall 2017, North Korea test launched a you know, ballistic missile 15 times, and also North Korea uh, undertook a uh, you know, nuclear testing of a hydrogen bomb with more than 150 you know, kilotons. President Moon was very, very frustrated. He was almost you know, desperate to overcome the situation. And his policy was shaped, his peace policy was shaped within the context of North Korean provocation. And more than that, you know, the United States was threatening to use a military option in North Korea. You know. General McMaster talking about you know, preventive war. The New York Times, Washington Post talk about uh, you know, pre preemptive strikes in North Korea. And after uh, ICBM test launching on November 29, 2017, Pentagon was thinking about the blood node strategy on North Korea. 
But the president made it very clear. His goal is to make Korean Peninsula a nuclear weapons free, peace plan prosperous. That was his goal. That is his goal. And also he set the three basic principles. No military action. Peace first. No war on the Korean Peninsula. He won't tolerate any kinds of military conflict on the Korean Peninsula. That's the first principle. Second principle, no nukes. Even though North Korea has threatening us with nuclear weapons, we will not seek the nuclear weapons possession. We would then retransfer American tactical nuclear warhead to South Korea. And third principle is no regime change. He made a very famous speech in Berlin on July 6, 2017, immediately after his inauguration. He made it very clear. We don't have any intention to change the regime in North Korea. We want to have a peaceful and uh, you know, good relations with North Korea. And we wanted to start with the small things first. In doing that, under the basis of those principles, he laid out four basic strategies. One is obviously peacekeeping through military deterrence and strengthening of alliance with the United States. At the same time, he wanted to pursue peacemaking efforts. Okay? He you know, suggested the adoption of end of war declaration and hopefully peace, you know, treaty and peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. And also through the Panmunjom summit, Pyongyang summit, he pushed a lot of efforts toward the conference building measures between North and South Korea. Okay. And since November 1st last year, there is a relative peace along the demilitarized zone. No hostilities under the ground, uh, under sea, in the air. 11 guard posts were removed from the DMZ, and North Korea removed 4,300 landmines. We removed 29 landmines. There is great in the efforts. Okay. At the same time, he has put a lot of emphasis on peace building. Peace building is what removing structural causes of conflict in Korea. He proposed the so-called peaceful economy, you know, peace through economy. He has been proposing inter-Korean railroad connection, energy networks, and eventually economic community, which can assure de facto, if not de jure, de jure uh, legal unification. That means what? Free flow of people, goods, and service across the DMZ so that we can live uh, without fear of war. And finally, he wanted to take a more proactive role. He hated Korea being passed by. He strongly reject Korea passing. He wanted to take a more leading and pre proactive role in creating peace on the Korean Peninsula. Those are the four strategies. But for him, the peace is the most precious value. Primacy, primacy of peace is the basic foundation of his peace initiative. But the problem is you cannot achieve peace without going through the nuclearization of North Korea. But North Korea has been, been extremely provocative. But the president was quite successful in persuading Kim Jong-un to declare complete denuclearization. He did at the Panmunjom summit. He again repeated, even he used his own voice to declare that uh, I wanted to pursue complete denuclearization in cooperation with South Korea. That's a great you know, progress. Okay. Then we had the Singapore summit on June 12th and we had a Hanoi summit February 27th and 8th. Everything went well until the Hanoi summit. As Lord Rick had pointed out, it was a kind of a setback. But the setback in long and treacherous, treacherous or perilous odyssey toward peace in Korea. Then all issues, why Hanoi summit failed, or failed to reach an agreement. But before I get into that one, you got to understand some conceptual issues. A lot of people talk about big deal, okay, small deal, you know, good enough deal, bad deal, and no deal. They, I need to <laughs> clarify them. We to, know this talk. You don't know. The big deal means what? Uh, it's American approach. Typically, you know, John Bolton approach, or well, uh, alternative is called the Libyan model. Uh, you dismantle entire nuclear weapons, even biochemical weapons, then we'll reward you, okay? And all for all, or all or nothing, okay? That is a big deal. Small deal is a North Korean approach. 
okay, I will completely and permanently dismantle nuclear facilities in Yongbyon, then you relax sanctions against us and set up liaison office in Pyongyang and let us have a peace declaration. That is a small deal. What is good enough deal? What good deal? This is a South Korean proposal. If North Korea comes up with a complete denuclearization of Yongbyon facilities, and plus uh, something else, therefore first dismantle nuclear facilities in Yongbyon, and then second stage, North Korea pledged to go for declaration of additional nuclear weapons. Then let us relax sanctions, not entire UN Security Council sanction resolutions, but only those affected inter-Korean relations, such as the resumption of gas and industrial complex, or resumption of Mount Gumgang Tourist Project, or other kinds of inter-Korean economic exchange and cooperation. Because President Moon believes that the complete and permanent dismantling of nuclear facilities in Yongbyon is a very significant step toward the irreversible stage of denuclearization in North Korea. Okay. Obviously, good enough deal was not, you know, was not taken. And finally, no deal means what really no deal. Okay. The failure to reach an agreement in Hanoi was a result of a mismatch of President Trump's big deal proposal and Chairman Kim Jong-un's small deal proposal. The gap between the two was a huge. Okay. They failed to reconcile. But here, one thing is very, we can note a very interesting phenomenon. That is, if you, you know, read Steve Biggin's speech at Stanford University in late January, he strongly implied incremental approach, parallel approach of denuclearization and peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. He even suggested a roadmap for negotiation. Apparently, North Korea seems to be preparing under the basis of Steve Began's input. Therefore, North Korean approach was very much predictable. But American approach was very, very unpredictable. Nobody expected that the US would come up with that old proposal of Libyan model. You take all the nuclear, biochemical weapons and missiles, then we'll reward you. We never thought about that kind of big deal as a kind of option. Okay. The gap was very big. But we still, you know, President Moon made it very clear in Washington you know, yesterday. He said that uh, he, does, he doesn't believe the Hanoi summit was a failure. Okay. It's a temporary setback okay, to open up more opportunities. Therefore, President Moon went to Washington with a three basic goals. First goal is to maintain momentum of dialogue with negotiation. Second, he tried to, he tries to persuade Washington and Pyongyang to avoid any kind of butterf butterfly effects. If they do minor things, they can produce catastrophic outcomes. Suppose if North Korea plays with you know, test launching of rocket for peaceful use of space, that can really lead to catastrophic outcomes. And also, if the United States uses too much hostile rhetoric and actions against North Korea, that can create a you know, catastrophic outcome. The President Moon really wanted to emphasize that the concerns parties, both sides, should avoid the kinds of butterfly effects. Third, he has a very, you know, specific you know, policy option. There is kind of extension of a good enough deal. That deal means what? Okay, let us have a comprehensive agreement on all for all or big deal. However, its implementation must be incremental. Okay? And also that implementation should be based on the very scrutinized roadmap and with a specific timetable. And also after the Hanoi, there has been some kinds of distrust between Pyongyang and Washington. In order, to, in order to make a breakthrough to that distrust gap, then there got to be some kinds of, you know, first actions, or what, you know, Ambassador Zhang Yong, our national security advisor, called the early harvest. That means what? North Korea could invite American experts uh, to the Pungeri nuclear test site, allowed inspection there. And also, as 
Chairman Kim Jong-un Kim Jong promised in his uh, Panmunjom Declaration, on oh, Pyongyang Declaration, he can allow, uh, he can allow you know, American experts to inspect the entire process of dismantling of a missile engine test site and launching pad in Dongchangli. That kind of first moves can precipitate the risk corresponding measures from Washington in terms of you know, relaxation of sanctions. You know, President Trump talked about the relaxation of sanctions on humanitarian assistance, including food aid and some kind of things. That kind of so-called small and minor, you know, the exchange of small and minor gestures between Pyongyang and Washington can open up you know, new opportunities for the comprehensive agreement on all for all and incremental implementation. And I believe that uh, President Moon was successful when he met the President Trump, because both President Trump and President Moon agreed on the importance of top-down approach, meaning what North-South Korean summit, US DPRK summit, and North-South US tri trilateral summit. He emphasized the importance of leaders' commitment and involvement in the negotiation. Trump, President Trump was very positive on the proposal. They were you know, very good things. And also, uh, President Trump you know, mentioned about step-by-step -step approach. And also, he also mentioned <coughs> the you know, inevitability of the small deals. That's another good sign. Okay? And I think our government can capitalize on it. And also, President, uh, President Trump strongly urged President Moon meet Chairman Kim Jong-un, okay, convey President Trump's message to him and figure it out, President, uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un's in, intention and, uh, and consult with President Trump later. Therefore, you know, consultative mechanism, consultative mechanism involving Trump, Moon, Kim has been resuscitated on the occasion of President Moon's visit to Washington. And also, in other words, the President Trump wanted the President Moon to play the role of a facilitator of dialogue and negotiation. That's a good thing. And also, a lot of people have, have showed worry, have shown some kind of worries on the cohesiveness of allocated alliance. Again, President Trump, even Michael Pence, and Pompeo, even John Bolton, they all emphasized, uh, emphasized the uh, <clears throat> ongoing cohesiveness of uh, allocated alliance. Again, yeah, well, simple reason is very simple. We are buying a lot of American advanced weapons, and also we are paying defense cost sharing, which President Trump requested. That's a sign of we, we are being a good ally, right? And that's a good sign. But uh, as to the idea of reaching some kinds of compromise, you know, reaching a comprehensive agreement on all for all incremental implementation, roadmap for implementation with timetable, and some early actions. Apparently, two leaders have, have not reached uh, that kind of agreement. Therefore, they should be worked out in days come. But you know, I'm somewhat you know, hopeful. You know, yesterday, I had a dinner with some of them, uh, my American, uh, the British friends, and they're, you know, you know, they are very cynical, really. And I know British, not, not cynical, but uh, they told me, that Chang in Moon, you are too optimistic. But I, I'm optimistic. The time is very good, because uh, President Trump will be visiting Japan in May and June. In May, on the occasion of inauguration of new emperor. In June, on the occasion of G20 meeting in Osaka. Therefore, it will be, if North Korea shows in a full response, it will be much easier to arrange some kind of event in Korea. because. President Trump visited Seoul November 2017. Time has elapsed quite long. Therefore, it is time for President Trump to pay a visit to in a Seoul. On the occasion of his visit to Seoul, we can work out something. We are really hoping, OK? But the real barrier to positive development in Korea is a North Korean attitude. North Korea held extended political bro uh, meeting on April 9th, and then plenary session of Central Committee of Korea Workers' Party on April 10th, and then yesterday they held the Supreme People's Congress. 
And one important thing was we should help ourselves. Don't trust nobody. Okay, what they call the chariot gangsen. You know, salvage yourself through your own effort. And in doing that, Kim Jong-un emphasized the importance of self-reliant economy. And also he gave a lot of emphasis on science and technology, indigenous, endogenous science and technology to boost the self-reliant economy. And, and also, you know, Kim Jong-un said that despite this horrible outside, you know, pressures such, such as sanction, we should survive and we should overcome that kind of you know, threat with our own efforts. That shows that what it is kind of you know, expression of non-compromise okay? uh, attitude on the part of North Korea. Therefore, President Moon will have a Herculean task to persuade the Chairman Kim Jong-un to come to the negotiation table to reach a meaningful you know, compromise. It's yet to be seen, but now situation is much better than just end up in Hanoi summit. It's yet to be seen. Thank you. Professor, thank you very much indeed. And I'm sure you're right to be optimistic <laughs> in your role. Um, that's where you have to be coming from, I think. Um, fascinating presentation. Very interesting and rather encouraging about President Moon's talks with President Trump yesterday in Washington. Mm -hmm. um, I think you sketched out very clearly the different scenarios, the different kinds of deal, and the sequencing, which is often so important in, mm -hmm. in these negotiations, uh, and South Korea's approach of a more incremental sequencing, perhaps under the banner of um, agreement in principle on, on objectives uh, in, in the shape of that big deal. And I'm sure there'll be lots of, lots of questions to follow that. Just one to kick us off. Um, what about the role of other countries in this? Um, I mean, obviously, China has an crucial role. Other members of the um, Security Council, like the UK, have, a, have an interest as well. Um, do you see a role for other well-intentioned countries in trying to help along this three-way um, America, North Korea, South Korea approach to the overall negotiation? Yeah, I see the great room for you know, third-party intervention in resolving North Korea nuclear issue. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, the way North Korea thinks seems to be very different from our way of thinking. Because North Korea thinks that the nuclear issue should be solved between Pyongyang and Washington, nobody else. Yeah. Okay? And Seoul can play not mediating role, Seoul can play facilitating role, because of Pyongyang does not trust you know, Seoul as much as we think. Okay? Because of Pyongyang thinks that, you know, Vice Prime Minister Chesan Yi made it very clear on, uh, that at his March 14 in a press conference in Pyongyang. He said that uh, South Korea and the US are on the same side. They are allies. And South Korea cannot be third party mediator, uh, which is interest free. Okay? But the South Korea can play a role of facilitation, a facilitator. Mm. Therefore, you know, we can do that. But uh, uh, President Trump yesterday appreciated the Chinese effort you know, really compl uh, for complying <laughs> with the uh, UN Security Council sanction resolutions. Mm -hmm. But one thing is very clear. If US DPLK talks do not make any further progress, then it's very likely that China and North Korea will you know, make an outreach to Moscow and Beijing. And or maybe despite American pressures, if US demand is uh, unreasonable, then China and uh, Russia uh, may go a different way. Okay, despite American pressures, therefore I think the United States could make a much more you know, prudent you know, uh, deliberation on how to deal with North Korea. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, let's open it up because lots of uh, expertise in the room here. Perhaps when people speak, you could just say uh, where you, where you are, who you are, where you're from, just so the professor knows um, uh, where you are uh, located. Please, you first, sir, and then, and then gentlemen here. Thank you very much. Duncan Bartlett, the editor of Asian Affairs magazine. I wanted to ask a question about the um, military relationship between South Korea and the United States. Um, following the Singapore summit, there was a decision by the United States to scale back the joint military exercises. Uh, what is the position now of the military alliance between South Korea and the US? Yeah, there's scaled down the, in the 
joint exercise uh, between the US and South Korea. But you know, you gotta make a distinction between joint military exercise and training. Training means what direct involvement of troop mobilization. But uh, we have been giving more emphasis on joint military exercise on the much more uh, reduced scale mm -hmm. and to the extent that it won't you know, precipitate the North Korean provocation. But the exercise going on, and also you've got to understand that we have a combined forces command in South Korea. Therefore, our American forces in South Korea and the you know, South Korean forces, they are you know, really integrated through this combined for command structure. Mm -hmm. There are all kinds of exercises, you know, uh, operational plan, you know, drafting and all these kinds of things. Therefore, I don't see any problem with the combat readiness of our local forces in South Korea. Uh, gentlemen, just in front of you there. <clears throat> Hi, Ronald Kim, uh, London School of Economics. I uh, thank you for your talk, very interesting. I was wondering, you s still seem to be quite optimistic, so I was wondering, do you think the comparison between the recent Hanoi summit and the Reichstag summit in the 80s between yes, President between Reagan Hanoi summit and? and the Reichstag summit between like Gorbachev and President Reagan in the 80s mm. or like Reagan reasonable? Yeah. Mm. Thank you. You know, there's a, you cannot compare, you know, Hanoi summit with the Reykjavik, you know. Uh, Reykjavik is much more bigger scale, scale involving two superpowers. But the Hanoi is between one superpower and one just you know small power. Okay, there is a fundamental asymmetry of power, and plus there has been much more close coordination. Okay, but in the case of Republic, the there was a so-called disparity of interest calculation on the part of the U.S. and the Soviet Union. But uh, in the case of Hanoi, American domestic politics seems to be you know <coughs> uh, factored in uh, more. Therefore, there's some qualitative difference. And also, I see as a rapid you know, summit was later saved, you know, the Hanoi summit will be saved in a positive direction. Do you think, Professor, you, you talked about, you mentioned no deal as a possibility. Uh, we are used to talk about no deal in this country at the moment. Um, uh, is there a risk that if the momentum um, doesn't get back into the process, that maybe American interest will decline? and we may settle for a sort of containment strategy, deterrent strategy, uh, and, and the, th the thrust behind denuclearization will dissipate? Is that a risk we should take seriously? No, I don't think so, but particularly given the President Trump's you know, reception of President Moon in Washington, D.C., I think that there is still a you know, high level of uh, preference and intensity on the part of President Trump. Therefore, I don't see any dissipation. Yes, any risk. Uh, yeah, no, no, and also, you know, Look, you know, President Trump, you know, look at all his foreign policy front. North Korea is the only viable, you know, card which he can play during the next presidential <coughs> election, okay? Right. And therefore, right. I think that the President Trump will pay attention to the North Korean issue. Therefore, there is another good sign coming from Washington, D.C. Yes, that has pluses and minuses if the President is looking at it in um, electoral terms in the U.S., but. Yes, I guess it will mean his attention will, be, will, will remain. Um, Ambassador Warwick Morris. Uh, there is a mic. Um, former ambassador to South Korea, Korea watcher for more than 40 years. Um, I'll, I, I mustn't be cynical or skeptical. I'm, I'm delighted that people are talking uh, and no longer threatening each other. The main trade-off seems to be sort of sanctions on the one hand and nuclear disarmament or, or scaling down on the other. But you've mentioned incremental changes too. And there are things like the Kaesong Industrial Zone, the Kumgangsan Tourism Project, rail road links, um, other things like m changing the armistice to a peace treaty. Um, are any of these things currently being discussed or are we just really back on nuclear versus sanctions? And do we really believe that the North Korean leadership will be prepared to to allow American or other inspectors in, because it's only with inspection, I think, that there can be any international uh, relief and, and, and knowledge that you know, denuclearization or the destruction of facilities has taken place. But as to inspection, well, also South Korean side was quite you know, skeptical about that aspect. But uh, when President Moon Jae-in and Chairman Kim Jong-un 
agreed on the Article 5 of Pyongyang Declaration about the permanent dismantling of nuclear facilities in Yongbyon. <coughs> After signing the, you know, the, the declaration, it is, uh, it is my understanding that President Moon raised the issue of inspection and verification to Chairman Kim Jong-un, and Kim Jong-un showed a very positive response. That is why our government has been saying that uh, you know, North Korea agreed on the verifiable dismantling, verifiable permanent dismantling of nuclear facilities in Yongbyon. The whole point is if US and North Korea build some kind of trust, and I think inspection will be possible. But here, one caveat is in order. That is what, when you talk about inspection and verification, they should be cooperative inspection and verification, not unilateral. North Korea will never accept any kind of unilateral imposition of inspection and you know, verification because North Korea argues that it is not surrendered the nation, okay? And therefore, that's a bit difficult part to overcome. But I think there's a room for negotiation uh, between in the two parties. And another, now our government is thinking about all kinds of so-called you know, measures to uh, reactivate the Kaesong Industrial <laughs> Complex and Mount Gyeongwang Tourist Project within the framework of UN sanctioned resolutions, okay? For example, opening up escrow account for the, you know, uh, gas on payment in South Korean bank, so that North Korean use it uh, buying you know, good, you know, the raw materials, you know, intermediate goods from South Korea. And as to the Kumgang Choice Project, you know, since the UN Security Council resolution provision is about the transfer of bulk cash, in, but if individual tourists go to Mount Kumgang, that won't violate the, you know, bulk cash transfer under the UN you know, Security Council sanctioned resolutions. There, there could be all other kinds of things. But here I want to emphasize one important point is that mm -hmm. I would strongly oppose the idea of the sanction for the sake of sanction. I would strongly oppose the idea of crime and punishment in dealing with North Korea. We got to think about strategic use of sanctions, okay? Suppose we feel lack of some sanctions that can facilitate the opening and reform in North Korea. North Korea might have a market system. And if North Korea fails to show cooperative behavior, that as President Trump pointed out, that he can apply the snapback clause. Mm -hmm. Then impact of sanction, reimposed sanction, will be 10 or 20 times greater than existing sanctions. Therefore, we need to think about sanction in more it's much more flexible term rather than very monolithic term. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, lady there and then a gentleman behind her. Hi, I'm Sally MacDonald. I'm a director of JP Morgan Japanese Investment Trust and head of equities at Marlborough Fund Managers. I have two questions for you. The first one is, if a peace treaty is signed, will that automatically technically require the UN to step down um, its troop presence on South Korean soil? And the second thing is, are the two Koreas aiming for North Korea to be a unified country with South Korea or a standalone country in its own right? Would you repeat the second one? <clears throat> are, the t are the two Koreas aiming for the North to be a unified country with South Korea or a standalone country in its own right? As to your first question, you know, in order to have a peace treaty, there got to be so-called termination of amnesty agreement by adopting some sort of peace declaration of end of war declaration. But our government proposal has been that uh, until we reach a viable peace treaty, uh, we would maintain uh, UN, uh, the UN command in South Korea get in temporal, in transitional terms. And also we would maintain the military demarcation line mm -hmm. to, com to avoid any kinds of, you know, a confusion followed by the, end, the termination of armistice agreement. But once we reach peace treaty, then the existence of UN command will subject to the intensive you know, debate. And I think that if we have a truly uh, viable peace treaty, you know, UNC will not have any justification, mm -hmm. or it will have a different kind of name. Mm -hmm. But as the American forces in South Korea, that's a different story. President Moon Jae-in made it very clear. Uh, allocate, ally, allocate U.S. alliance and American forces in South Korea um, so very in matters between Washington and Seoul. They have nothing to do with the end of war declaration, termination, um, armistice agreement, and peace treaty, okay? 
Therefore, our government has made it very clear in the difference between the two. Mm. As the unification, you know, there is some confusion. Okay, most ideal form of unification is one single unified nation state. That means one nation, one state, one government, one system. But from practical point of view, it is impossible to achieve it. Okay, that can be done either through what South Korean absorption of North Korea, North Korean communization of South Korea, or as a result of what, like in Vietnam. The North Korean proposal is federation or confederal model of unification. One nation, one state, two systems, two local government. But our government doesn't accept that proposal because it is impossible to have you know, communism and capitalism under one state sovereignty. Therefore, our government proposal since 19, 1989 is a Korean Commonwealth or Korean community in a unification model. That means what is a union of North South Korean state as an interim stage. Therefore, first stage is a reconciliation and cooperation. Second stage is a creation of union of North South Korean state. And finally, when North South Korea become homogeneous, then the people after us will have some kinds of national referendum and decide on the ultimate form of unification, or be it division, or union of state, or federation, confederation, or single unified nation states. Uh, therefore, when we talk about unification, we got to think about all different kinds of concepts of unification. There is no such thing as one monolithic way of defining uh, unification. Therefore, our government's you know, present most basic policy is what? Let us have a peace through economy. Then we can have a free flow of people and goods and services. We'll have a reconciliation. Then we can have some kinds of European Union type of economic you know, union, okay? Therefore, Union of North South Korean state. Then there will be free flow of people, goods, and services, okay? Of course, on the Korea, North Korean side, they may control, okay? But well, once we reach that stage, then we can talk about another form of unification in much more meaningful terms. The one now matters is peace first, and then debate on unification, not unification per se. Right. Uh, I think it was a gentleman there, oh, sorry, a lady just there in front of you, and then a lady here, and then here. So we're, we're getting a, quite a number of questions coming. Please. Thank you so much. Uh, Tammy Kim's with the New York Times opinion page. Uh, Professor Moon, I was curious about um, sequencing. There's been a lot of debate about is it peace first and then denuclearization. You suggested in your talk that denuclearization is sort of a prerequisite to peace. Is this just an academic debate or is it something that really tells us something about confidence building measures such as a peace resolution? Thank you. Mm. But when it took denuclearization per se, it start with freeze and declaration and inspection of those declared, declared facilities and, and weapons. And then you have verification, and then ultimate you know, dismantling. There is a sequencing of so-called denuclearization. But problem is, that what is the origin of North Korean possession of nuclear weapons? That's the insecurity on the part of North Korea. Therefore, we got to resolve North Korean sense of insecurity then how can we solve the problem? We need the peace, okay? Mm -hmm. Then how do you build peace? Then you start with a terminating armistice agreement, okay, through the peace declaration of end of war declaration. And then you got to have some kinds of peace treaty or code, okay? And then you got to have some kind of viable and lasting peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. That is why peace regime and denuclearization go in hand in hand. That is what even Steve Vigan made that point when he gave a speech at the Stanford University in late January. Therefore, sequencing is a nuclear, denuclearization sequencing is one thing, but it got to be linked to the issue of peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. That is why our government has been emphasizing that the parallel approach to two you know, dimensions, and they have a so-called mutually reinforcing you know, effort too. Therefore, they cannot be separated. Therefore, some you know, pundit in Washington argued that the denuclearization first, then we can have a peace. I really don't buy that argument. It is impossible. Uh, lady here, you've been very patient. Thank you. Well, it's 
all just as well. Hilda Rapp, Centre of International Peacebuilding. Professor Moon, thank you very much. In fact, you've answered almost all my questions <laughs> um, because uh, these were the kind of the issues that were really kind of on top of my mind. But one of the things that underlies all that is uh, you're talking about confidence building, trust building, uh, and uh, co cooperation. And I was just wondering whether the civil society layer uh, of, of that process uh, is something that has become more topical in the presidential discussions, because it was definitely very much part of the, uh, the letter that the civil society organizations wrote, uh, arguing for step-by-step, bottom-up, if you like, integration, as well as the top-down process. Thank you. That's an excellent question, you know, because uh, if you observe the recent evolution of peace talks on the Korean Peninsula and denuclearization talks on the Korean Peninsula, they're all state-centric. But they should be complemented by the civil society approaches. If I would strongly encourage the role of non-governmental actors in proposing new ideas and facilitating the entire process of negotiation and et cetera. But up to now, how summit, summit diplomacy you know, crowded any kinds of you know, non-governmental act, non actors you know, approach to the problem. Therefore, it is time for us to, to, more, to talk about more on this civil society-centric or NGO-centric approach to Korean peace problem. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Moon, Isabel Hilton, journalist. Um, you mentioned Libya in the context of John Bolton's grand bargain. Now, clearly, Libya is not a terribly attractive option for North Korea, given what happened. I wondered if you had a sense of what kind of security guarantees could be offered to North Korea, um, and w which would be tolerable to the other stakeholders. I'm thinking beyond the existing Chinese one, which North Korea might well feel is insufficient. But what would what what kind of framework could be put in place to to give North Korea the security that it would prefer to have? I remember attending one conference in which a very you know prominent North Korean uh, senior officials you know, attended, and in fact that issue came out. That one senior North Korean foreign minister official made a very interesting proposal. If U.S. Normalized diplomatic ties with us without any preconditions. We'll give up nuclear weapons. We'll have a military alliance with the United States. But we should really pay attention to the, gen the, not the I won't you know, reveal the gender and the, that officials in the point. Therefore, what North Korea wants is really normalization with the United States. Okay? Therefore, even if the North Korea doesn't go through the complete denuclearization. If the United States opens the liaison office, have a diplomatic relations there, normalization there, have an, even have a, some kind of military partnership. For me, I think that's the surest way to get rid of nuclear weapons. Of course, China will not be happy, okay? But, uh, you know, but what North Korea wants is obviously political assurance. The number one <coughs> condition for political assurance is, in fact, uh, getting rid of hostile intent and policy. What are the hostile intent and policy? Sanction relief. Then liaison office. Then normalization. Second, military assurance. Obviously, you know, continuing suspension of joint military exercise and training. They're suspending for the deployment of strategic weapons along the Korean Peninsula and some form of non-aggression treaty. Then economic assurance. Okay, obviously, what? in allowing North Korea to become a member of IMF, you know, World Bank, Asia Development, and et cetera, and U.S. playing role of boosting international trade and investment in North Korea. And also, North Korea will be wanting peaceful use of atomic energy. North Korea will be using, uh, will be uh, arguing for peaceful use of space, the meaning of the satellite launching. I think those are the kinds of no what North Korea want, okay? But here, the fund the bottom line is this, uh, hostile intent in the enmity between Washington and Pyongyang. If the U.S. can take measures to fundamentally reduce hostility toward North Korea, and I think that would be the surest way to solve the North Korean nuclear problem. Very good. Please. 
Uh, Kim Song Mi, uh, Ritual Information and IAEA. Um, I was wondering how do we uh, understand uh, the Free Chosun Movement these days? They are free, free Chosun Movement. Free Chosun yeah, movement. is it some kind of noise in this bigger context yeah. of um, uh, peace process, or is it something that we need to take uh, note of in the context of, in, especially in the context of uh, no regime change principle? In fact, I do not know about the Free Chosun movement. There are some media reports. If I'm, you know, Dr. Kim, I'm very sorry that I cannot comment on free choice on issues. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know, other than their raid into uh, DPRK in an uh, embassy in Spain, uh, we do not know anything about We know about Adrian Hong and all these kinds of things. I, I'm familiar with the link activities in the United States, helping North Korean defectors and etc. But as to free choice on, I do not know any details about the free choice on death. I cannot comment on it. Okay. Thank you. We're beginning to run out of time. So, gentlemen here, then there were two people to, to your left who wanted a question. In fact, you, you sir, first, and then, the, and then the last two questions there. First of all, thank you for coming and your time this morning. My name is Henry Tillman. I manage a proprietary database on China. Excuse me. And I focus on the Polar Silk Road. You are one of the biggest users of LNG in the world. And for those of the, in the room that don't know this, Russ is going to go from 11 million tons of LNG in 2016 to 60 million tons of LNG in 2021 to 135 million tons a year in 2035. The, the, uh, uh, the Siberia uh, pipeline already works. And of course, it's going to go through Sakharin Island and through Zarabino. And the cost is substantially less than anybody in the West, Australia, USA, et cetera. That will have a huge effect on your economics. Yes, and also for North Korea. He knows all this because I was with Jim Rogers this week in, in uh, Singapore. So the point is, with those, those numbers and those economics, how will that tilt your affiliations all the way on that side of the map versus your neighbors on that side of the map? Thank you. OK, thank you. Yeah, because uh, the President Moon had proposed the so-called uh, uh, New Korean Peninsula Economic Initiative. The number one priority is linking railroad system the trans Chinese railroad system and Trans-Siberian trans railroad system. And also our government is very strongly interested in uh, linking up the, the natural gas pipeline from the North Korea all the way to South Korea, passing through North Korea. We are, we, we are talking about even the supplying up so surplus hydraulic power from Habarovsko area to North Korea. Therefore, if we make the little progress Real, you know, some tangible progress in nuclear issue. North and South Korea have a lot to cooperate with each other, particularly with regard to infrastructure and energy, <coughs> and even mineral resources too. That is a really most promising area. That is why Jim Rogers you know, said that he you know, declared that he sold all the, you know, you know, his stocks in Japan and he's you know, planning to invest in North Korea. Therefore, I think that his point is not over exaggeration. Mm -hmm. His point. It makes sense. Right, we're down to our last five minutes. I think the gentleman here, and there was somebody else next to you, I think, who wanted a word. So why don't we have two questions together, if you don't mind, Professor, and then we'll call it a day. Please. Um, Edward Howard from Oxford University. I don't mean to be the cynical British person, but um, how much of North Korea's motivation to keep its nuclear program is simply motivated by deterrence? OK. And the last question. Christina Variali from the Royal United Services Institute. Um, I hate to be the, the person that's going to bring up the elephant in the room, but I think human rights is an issue that is often overlooked in this conversation. Um, it's been mentioned a few times throughout the summit processes, but I think it's an issue that needs to be more prominent. Um, how do you see that playing into um, moving forward with the peace process? For example, imagine a scenario briefly where um, cooperation on the railroads progresses, but yet the, the refurbishment of the railroads in North Korea is actually used to service some of their prison camps. Um, how, how are those sort of issues being addressed as we try and build more peace and prosperity on the peninsula, whilst noting that actually that's going to be a really difficult challenge to address? Thank you. But as to North Korea motive, yes, it's, a, it's a quite natural for North Korea will try to retain its nuclear weapons while enhancing economic development, even though since April 20th last year, North Korea has so-called abandoned the Pyongyang line simultaneous push of you know, economic development and nuclear weapons. You know. Obviously, North Korean calculus would tell that they you know, keep the last element of nuclear weapons while maximizing benefit from outside. We all know that one. 
But the whole point is how we co convince North Korea that there will be no really real threat coming from the United States. And the getting rid of nuclear weapons will bring you really bonanza. Okay? Yeah. That is a very <coughs> difficult process. But uh, that is why our government has been proposing so called, let us uh, some make uh, some small dis success, success boom. Then they can lead to the big thing. Therefore, we are well aware of North Korea you know, motives and intention. But uh, with that understanding, we have been approaching to North Korea. About the human rights issues, you know, <coughs> I think the current government is really relying on President Kim Dae-jung's you know, approach to North Korea. President Kim Dae-jung has argued that because he was criticized from all sides for his, his lack of attention to human rights paradigm in North Korea, mm -hmm. while he was supporting Myanmar, Aung San Suu Kyi, and East Timor, and et cetera. But uh, he answered in this way. First, given current hostile relations, if you start to talk about human rights conditions in North Korea, that will create a trade-off between human rights and peace, because North Korea will consider our human rights and our claims as a in our effort to interfere domestic politics in North Korea, therefore threat to North Korean regime. Second, President Kim says there is a trade-off between the human rights and basic human and basic human needs. Whenever we talk about human rights, North Korea refused to get any kind of humanitarian assistance, <laughs> including food aid. And third, President Kim said that uh, yes, human rights and democracy are important, okay, but uh, we cannot create the human rights and uh, democracy in North Korea. Okay. North Koreans should achieve democracy and human rights by themselves. What we can do is we can only create the you know, milieu conducive to democracy and human rights in North Korea. And therefore, he has been arguing that dem democracy and human rights from within, not from without. Okay. And also another, let me add one more point because I have been interacting with North Koreans a lot. Once you build the trust, you can talk about human rights very openly. Okay? But without trust, they show enormous hostile behavior. Therefore, that is why we need to build the trust first, even for the sake of you know, human rights conditions in North Korea. Very good. Well, look, um, Professor, thank you very much for, I thought, a really brilliant survey of a very, very complex picture. Uh, you were taken quite widely around the area in questions. Uh, this is one of the most complex uh, and deep-seated um, uh, differences and divisions uh, and therefore negotiations anywhere in the planet. And yet the issues are vital for global security. Um, and we in London probably should be taking more uh, interest in paying more attention to the issues and what we can do to help here. Um, I've found that fascinating myself. I'm sure everybody in the room has. Thank you very much. Thank you.